the last speaker for this morning is Trammell. He is doing awesome research on bootstrapping more secure laptops or servers. And he's doing ba that basically by moving the root of trust into the right protected ROM. He's building an open source custom firmware. So big ups for that. And also encouraging the research on this field, which I believe it's super interesting. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm Trammell Hudson with uh, Two Sigma Investments, and for the past several years, I've been researching firmware uh, security vulnerabilities and looking at how they affect systems. Two years ago, I presented uh, my work on Thunderstrike here at CCC. And this was the first firmware attack against MacBooks that allowed an attacker to overwrite the motherboard boot ROM. The year after that, I collaborated with Zeno uh, Kova and Corey Kallenberg from LegbaCore, both of whom are now at uh, Apple doing firmware work. And we ported a bunch of Windows uh, UEFI vulnerabilities over to the Mac and showed that the software platform, the UEFI software platform, you know, allowed very portable attacks to be done. This also allowed a remote attacker with uh, code execution on, on your machine to overwrite the motherboard boot ROM. But more than just breaking things, um, what I really like to do is take things apart and understand how they work and document them so that other people can build systems on top of them. And that's why I'm really excited to be talking uh, to you all about my project Heads, which is uh, a open source firmware and bootloader for uh, laptops and servers. Uh, the, the name is kind of a play on the popular Tails distribution, which is uh, a stateless Linux for when you don't want to leave any traces of what you're doing on your machine. Heads is for the opposite case. It's where you want to be able to trust the machine and you want to be able to trust that the data you store on the machine uh, is, is safe and unmodified. And let's back up for a quick minute and just talk about why firmware security is, is so important. That this is the code that is executed by the CPU uh, when it comes out of reset. This is the first instruction that the CPU executes. And so it's in a really privileged position to be able to circumvent any sort of OS or other policies. And there's no shortage of talks that you can, you can watch on uh, interesting attack vectors using firmware-based malware. One that I really liked was last year uh, at DEF CON, the Intel Advanced Threat Research presented an attack that uh, showed how firmware could, malicious firmware could circumvent the uh, hypervisors. They then went further and showed how buggy firmware allowed a unprivileged guest inside a virtual machine to escalate into uh, privileges inside the hypervisor. And for that reason, it's really important that firmware vulnerabilities and firmware bugs have a way to get patched. These aren't just theoretical research vulnerabilities either. We know that there are malicious organizations and hacking groups that are selling uh, firmware rootkits to whoever will pay, including uh, nation state adversaries that are using them for their, uh, per their persistent threats. And they are very persistent because they are in the motherboard boot ROM. So you reinstall the OS, they're still there. You swap out the hard drive, they're still there. And some vendors are even bundling uh, these rootkits into uh, their official ROMs. Um, that they are using them to install uh, the bloatware or whatever uh, adware they want to put into the OS. So even after you reinstall uh, a clean version of the OS, this particular vendor's uh, system would install, uh, install its own uh, additions. Some of those had vulnerabilities that could then be exploited by attackers. This particular case, the vendor was, uh, received enough bad press that they released a firmware update that uh, patched this vulnerability. And they had to do that. This wasn't something that the users could do on their own. They couldn't update the, soft, uh, the firmware in their machine the way they do with uh, their operating system or an application. And in fact, most firmware vulnerabilities never see uh, patches get deployed out to the end user. Part of the reason for that is that the, uh, the, 
firmware is usually four or five companies removed from uh, the, the end user. That there's the open source reference implementation from Intel uh, called uh, Tiano Core or EDK2. When vulnerabilities are patched in there, they have to get pulled by the independent BIOS vendor and merged into the IPv tree. And then the BIOS vendor sells that to the device manufacturers. So they have to uh, package up a release that then gets pulled by the device manufacturer. It has to get QA'd against however many motherboards they want to test it on. And then it has to get, again, pulled by the uh, original equipment manufacturer to get rebranded and whatever value they want to add. And then sometimes it has to go through the operating system vendor to even make it out to the end user. And as a result of this, most of the time, products do not receive any updates after they've been sold. Uh, there's one exception. Um, in this chart, you can see that uh, Apple it builds their own firmware. And in my work with them, I've been really pleased that they've rolled out patches for eight years of hardware, uh, which is above and beyond what any other uh, firmware vendor is doing right now. When EFI was introduced, it brought a lot of complexity. Um, and that, that uh, the Linux community was very skeptical of, as to what the value was going to be provided uh, by all this complexity. It's basically an entire operating system's worth of code. Um, and it's not that the 16-bit real mode BIOS was all that much better. In fact, it had uh, its own set of issues. but. It was small, it was simple, it did one thing, it did it okay. Um, and it took a long time for UEFI to even become widely supported. But even now, most systems ship with both the UEFI and a BIOS compatibility module. So they basically doubled their attack surface for potential bugs and vulnerabilities. So the state of the firmware world today is that uh, updates are rare. Uh, patches, if they ever come out, take a long time to make it through the process. Users can't fix things on their own. And we can't see what's inside, since most of them are built with closed source components. And that's not a great state for something that is as privileged as firmware. So it, it's my belief that firmware needs to be built with open source. It must be flexible so we can adapt it to our needs for our systems. It needs to be built with software that we understand and that we use for, uh, in other applications so that it can get widely tested and well tested. It needs to be built in a reproducible manner so that we can be secure against uh, build uh, chain attacks. And it needs to be cryptographically measured so that we can be sure that this, what we flash on the system is what is actually running on the system. And that's the philosophy behind heads. It's built on uh, the free software core boot firmware, uh, plus a Linux kernel in ROM that acts as a bootloader, and then a lot of uh, security research and tools uh, that uh, uh, help us try to build slightly more secure systems. Using Linux as a bootloader is not a particularly new idea. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, when we started building large-scale Linux clusters, we were very frustrated with the, uh, the, the inflexibility of DHCP and Pixie booting uh, large machines. Uh, even with those frustrations, we built uh, one that was about the 30th fastest in the world on the top 500. Meanwhile, uh, my colleague Ron Minnick at Los Alamos was also building large clusters and had the observation that the BIOS uh, enumerates all the buses, initializes a bunch of devices, finds the Linux kernel, and then, and then the Linux kernel enumerates all the buses, initializes all the devices. And he thought, this is, this is silly. Why are we doing this twice? So he had the idea to build a version of Linux that ran in, in the ROM. Uh, he called this project Linux, uh, Linux BIOS. And it went on to power the MRC cluster, which was uh, the third fastest machine in the world in uh, 2003. In 2008, Linux BIOS underwent a major refactoring, and it was renamed to Coreboot. And Google chose to use Coreboot as the firmware on their Chromebooks, 
uh, which are at this point the only uh, non-UEFI x86-based uh, laptops uh, that you can buy. And they've done a really some great work in trying to lock down the configuration and the firmware on the Chromebooks. Um, Ron, uh, coincidentally, moved to Google in 2011 and is continuing to work on the core boot project there. The, there we go. So core boot has uh, three stages that it goes through as it starts up the machine. The first one is a very small amount of real mode assembly uh, because your modern 64-bit laptop still boots up in, uh, in real mode with 16-bit just like it's the 1970s. So that's a very small amount of code, about 1.5K. That in turn sets up a C runtime environment uh, with what's called caches RAM mode and it calls into the ROM stage which is about 70K. Heads has moved the, uh, the TPM initialization early in the ROM stage before DRAM is set up to help uh, measure the boot block and provide a, uh, a static root of trust that's hopefully uh, a little bit more secure. And because that measurement is done early on, our trusted computing base is actually quite small. Um, this is a fraction of 1% of the size of a UEFI firmware, uh, which is usually about 16 megs once it's uncompressed. The ROM stage then measures and executes the RAM stage, which does the more traditional uh, walk the bus, find, figure out what devices are on there, but it doesn't initialize them. It just enumerates them and generates the descriptors uh, for Linux. It also installs the SMM handler for system management mode. It then measures and jumps into the payload, and that whole process takes uh, less than a second. Um, so the, uh, it's able to get into the payload and actually get to the, the user code very, very quickly. On something like the X230, uh, it's able to go from power on to a interactive recovery shell in less than two seconds. And that includes bringing up the TPM, doing cryptographic measurements, and assessing the state of the system. Because we now have Linux at this point, we have all the flexibility that comes with that. We can implement uh, boot scripts as with the, the full power of uh, the shell or the C language runtime. We're not stuck with uh, the limited functions of UEFI. Linux supports lots of different file systems. It supports lots of different devices. It supports lots of different encryption methods. And this gives us the ability to use any of them for your specific application in contrast to UEFI, which supports unencrypted FAT file systems on the first drive that have to be in the first one gig or something. It's really, really limited as to how it can find its boot device. There's a saying in the, uh, in the open source community that with enough, uh, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. And Linux has a lot more eyes looking at it that you know, the device drivers and the file systems and the encryption have been reviewed by uh, both uh, white hat and black hat uh, people around the world. The, the UEFI uh, versions of these do not have that same level of scrutiny. So using both the UEFI drivers and then having to run whatever on top of it increases the attack surface but by putting Linux in the ROM and depending on its drivers, we've reduced our attack surface uh, very dramatically. More importantly though, Core Boot and Linux are open source. So it is possible to build custom versions for the device drivers that you need, for the file systems that you need. It's possible to fix bugs when they come out and sign and install your own kernels. You don't have to wait for the, uh, the vendor to get around to doing it. And the third major component of, uh, of Heads is a tool called KExec, which is a system call that was added for the Linux BIOS project back in 2003 by Eric Biederman that allows a running kernel to do a graceful shutdown and start a new kernel without having to go through the, the uh, reboot process. So this allowed, it, on their application, it allowed them to do very fast reboots of their cluster nodes and in the head's case, it allows us to act as a bootloader, where we can find 
the real kernel that you want to run and exec it. Because heads is quite small. It, it has to fit in four megabytes of ROM. <coughs> so it's not something that you're going to run as a day-to-day -day sort of OS. <coughs> Hopefully this won't explode on me again. Because we, we have the born shell, most of the policies and the startup scripts in heads are implemented as, uh, as shell scripts. In this case, we're able to uh, pass in a new set of command line parameters, a new initial RAM disk, and in this case, we can even start a hypervisor. Um, and all of that can happen very, very quickly, as well as with, uh, with a good degree of security. <coughs> so, those are the building blocks that Heads is built on, Core Boot, Linux, and tools like KXEC. But it now gives us a, a really nice platform to begin uh, experimenting with additional security features. Um, and before we go too deep down the rabbit hole of you know, security and threat models, I want to quote my friend Steph, who said that your threat model is not my threat model, um, but you know, your threat model is okay as well. That we all have different things we want to protect from different attackers who are willing to spend different amounts of effort to go after them. And the, the nice thing about having an open source is we can build systems tailored to uh, your individual threat model. So a lot of these things may not actually apply to your specific threats, but the fact that we can build them is a great capability. Last year, uh, Johanna uh, Rutowska reminded us that firmware is not just in our CPU. Firmware is in our Wi-Fi card. It is in our GPU. It is in our SSD. It is in our keyboards. And all of these devices might be trying to uh, subvert the, the boot process. One way to handle that is to uh, take Peter Stooges' advice of uh, disassembling the machine and ripping out anything we can't control. If this is your threat model, his instructions are really worth following. They're really thorough about what pieces are potentially of concern. And you're going, right now, you will have to open up your laptop to install heads. It's, uh, uh, it's not quite as easy to install as most Linux distributions because we have to flash it into the, the motherboard boot ROM. While we're in there, uh, we take advantage of some features that uh, to the best of my knowledge, no UEFI system is using. Um, these flash chips have a hardware write protect mode where you can s specify part of the chip is, uh, is write only, excuse me, is read only, uh, write once. And this gives us our immutable boot block in which to store the uh, trusted computing base, the TCB, so that we can measure the rest of the system. We also then suggest disconnecting the write protect pin from the motherboard, which protects against uh, certain classes of attacks like the, um, uh, the Intel closed chassis adapter that allows external JTAG uh, of the CPU. Depending on your threat model, you might want to cover that chip in epoxy as well to frustrate uh, evil mate attacks that want to do uh, physical programming on it. Disconnecting the write protect pin also serves to protect from other devices uh, on the machine that have access to those pins. Uh, devices like the management engine, which is a really uh, scary CPU inside the CPU. Um, Rudolf Merrick, uh, two years ago at CCC, called it the Matryoshka CPU. And uh, uh, Igor Skrzynski um, uh, detailed what are the capabilities of the management engine? And they're really worrisome that it runs a uh, opaque, uh, obfuscated uh, blob of code, about five megabytes, that the CPU can't see. The management engine can read and write all of main memory. It can uh, read from the keyboard and video. Uh, it can receive Java byte codes over the network and execute them on behalf of someone outside the machine and it's listening on the network even when the system's powered off. So this is basically a rootkit inside the chipset, as uh, some folks have called it. So that concerned me a lot, and I spent some time uh, looking at how its firmware images are built and realized that we can build modified, reduced functionality uh, firmware for it that removes all of the rootkit functions. 
um, and just leaves the CPU bring up module. This takes that five megabytes and shrinks it down to about, uh, about 40K uh, of space. So we don't know exactly what it's doing in that 40K, but we at least know it doesn't have a device driver or a Java virtual machine or a lot of the other functions. And we've successfully done this on uh, both uh, Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, um, like the X230 ThinkPads, as well as modern uh, Skylake CPUs, like the Shell Chromebook. And that's really encouraging, that if we can apply this to more modern hardware, that allows us to you know, move away from our, our five-year-old uh, uh, ThinkPads to something a little shinier. So, the management engine isn't the only device that uh, might be trying to subvert the boot process. Um, you know, again, Johanna showed us there are lots of things to be worried about. Intel's UEFI architects, Yao and Zimmer, recommend that firmware turn on the IOMMU, uh, called VTD, to protect against uh, rogue devices. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, since they've written this guide, no UEFI firmware is taking advantage of the IOMMU. So it's a great piece of hardware to have, but it doesn't help if you don't turn it on. Uh, Linux, uh, meanwhile, has no problem uh, taking advantage of it. So we use it, uh, we get, essentially, we get that DMA protection for free by using Linux as our bootloader uh, in the ROM. Another way devices, rogue devices can try to interfere with the boot process is by providing option ROMs, which are executable code to be run by the BIOS that have a sort of a device driver. Um, and this code can do things like uh, log keystrokes and then try to exfiltrate passwords, as we see here. That problem was initially reported in 2007 by John Heisman. Uh, at uh, Black Hat, again by Snare in 2012, and then again by my work on Thunderstrike. And uh, as of last week, a official fix has finally rolled out for it to close that particular vulnerability. Um, folks who are using Core Boot have this as a option that they can say, "This, my, I am concerned about this threat. Let me let me fix this. Let me disable this function." And they point out that. It might cause degraded functionality, but that's something you can QA on your own system. And in practice, with Linux as your bootloader in the ROM, you don't use the option ROMs for anything. Everything uh, is done with, with Linux's own device drivers, so you're not dependent on the um, whatever limited uh, uh, functionality the option ROM provided. So now that we have, we've taken our building blocks and we hopefully have protected the boot process and hopefully the, the code that's running is what we think it is, we need to turn to how do we secure the secrets on the machine. And I'm a, a huge fan of the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module. And I know in the free software community, it's been largely uh, unwelcome. It has not received a very uh, welcome reception because of the way it's been used for DRM and other, uh, other uh, user hostile things. Since we control the TPM from the first instruction in the, uh, in the boot block, we're able to use it in ways that we want to. Uh, so we don't have to enable DRM, but we can use it to protect our secrets. And the, the way that it does that is it keeps track of what code is executed as the system boots and it hashes uh, that code into special registers called PCRs. And the idea is that you can extend the PCR by hashing the next module of code and then hashing that with the previous hash. And this creates a chain of trust uh, that allows us to say, if these hashes match uh, the expected values, only the code that we b want to have run has run. And then the TPM will only decrypt the, uh, the disk encryption key if those PCRs match, which means that uh, the code that we want to have run is what has been executed. This means if someone manages to overwrite the, um, uh, the non-write protected part of the ROM, that will change those measurements and the TPM won't reveal the key uh, to them. It also takes a user password and that password is validated by the TPM hardware itself, which gives us uh, hardware rate limiting on how often an attacker can try. It also gives us the ability to do hardware-based uh, 
uh, retry uh, limits so that the TPM will flush the key if, they, if an attacker in possession of your machine tries too long. That does mean there's now another way to lose your, your uh, disk encryption key. And there's the, the old joke about there are two types of people with encrypted drives, those who have lost data due to forgetting their key and, and those who will. So what uh, HEADS does when you generate your key is it's, it takes that key and splits it into multiple pieces that you can then share either to friends or to backup services where each piece doesn't let you decrypt it, but you can combine them with uh, Shamir secret sharing to uh, regenerate the, uh, the cryptographic disk encryption key. We're also able to take advantage of best practices like using uh, the, uh, including the disk encryption key headers in the PCRs that we use to seal the disks. This avoids a certain class of evil made attack where someone swaps out your drive, may not be in your threat model, but it's easy to do with just a few lines of shell script. So we, hopefully we now trust that the system is running the code we think it is, but how does it prove to us that it is actually our machine? That someone hasn't snuck into our hotel room and swapped out everything and left, left, you know, rep carefully replaced our stickers to make us believe we're typing our password into to our own computer. Um, some uh, anti-evil made uh, toolkits will encrypt a secret a secret phrase and then display it to you if and only if the PCRs match. But that's subject to a replay attack. What Matthew Garrett demonstrated last year at uh, uh, 32C3 was using the time-based uh, time one-time password uh, used by Google Authenticator to protect the firmware and have it attest to the user that it is unmodified. So when the system boots, and it goes through uh, measuring all of the various components, the, uh, the TPM will only release the secret uh, if those PCRs match. The firmware then hashes that along with the current time and generates a six-digit value that it prints on screen. You compare that to what's on your phone, and that tells you uh, whether or not you can trust uh, the, the machine. It's a uh, uh, it's a great idea, and it's implemented, again, as a very small shell script uh, to read, read the value from the TPM, unseal it, and then compute the, uh, uh, the hash of it. This also allows us to start making a transition from the TPM, rooted, uh, TPM static root of trust to a PGP-based trust, where, most importantly, this is a TPM key Excuse me, this is a PGP key that you, the owner of the computer, control, not some random vendor or some random hardware device manufacturer that's going to lose the key and allow uh, malware like Stuxnet to use it to um, circumvent security. The boot script in heads, again, it's a small shell script, is able to use uh, GPG to verify the next stages of the, uh, the hypervisor, the initial RAM disk, and the kernel. Um, and it also then uses the, uh, the TPM's counters to help pre prevent against rollback, where someone takes your drive and rolls it back to a previous version, perhaps with a vulnerability that they can exploit. So this, this allows, the, uh, allows us to be sure that not only are we running the firmware, excuse me, the, the OS that we think we should be running, uh, it ensures us that someone hasn't been able to substitute one that uh, a vulnerable version. Having the PGP key also allows us to take advantage of uh, an idea from Android and uh, Chrome OS, which is the um, uh, the DM Verity uh, read-only root file system. This hashes all of the blocks and then hashes all of the uh, the hashes and so on up until it gets to a, uh, to a root hash in the tree that is then signed. This allows the kernel on every read access in logarithmic time to verify the, uh, essentially a signature on that data. This does require a read-only uh, root file system, but it gives us uh, even more confidence that the system has been untampered with. Once you're running your OS, it, it's good to have 
you know, some uh, security conscious thoughts as well. Um, you know, Heads is mostly focused on how do we securely transition to an OS, and that's OS you run is up to you. Um, I, I like cubes. It's reasonably secure. It's highly recommended by uh, people who know uh, about endpoint security. And the cubes team uh, recognizes that firmware security is a vital piece of system security. For their, for their next release, Cubes R4, they're going to require the machines have open source firmware, uh, such as Core Boot, and I hope that Heads is going to be a piece of that. Uh, I've also been uh, working with, with the Cube software and have modified it to work with things like the DM Verity read-only root file system. This now allows uh, the user to lock down the configuration so that uh, uh, someone can't tamper with their, their setup. It also uh, gives you a recovery mode that allows you to uh, fix things up and resign the OS. Reproducible builds are really important so that everyone can verify what, uh, that the builds match what they should. Um, in, in the case of, uh, of heads, we have a lot of upstream dependencies that aren't reproducible, so we're working with them to try to patch them. Uh, we've patched uh, Zen. They've accepted uh, that commit. We've also built some tools to let you build um, initial RAM disks in a reproducible way. Uh, this works with cubes, with heads, and we're hoping other Linux distributions pick it up as well. All of uh, our tree is cryptographically signed, so hopefully uh, GitHub's not trying to slip in any patches. Um, and it is open source, so we encourage everyone to read through it. Uh, no NDA is required, unlike most of the, the UEFI sources. So that's sort of the state of where things are. It's pretty much in very beta, but it's, it is usable. Um, but there are a lot of areas where we could continue to do research. Things like the embedded controllers on Chromebooks are open source. We can use those to help with our root of trust as well. Um, Porting core boot to more modern platforms would let us take advantage of things like tamper switches and Intel boot guard. I'm also working on porting core boot over to server platforms so that we can use it for uh, more secure cloud hosting. Um, servers have a very different threat model from, uh, from laptops, and a lot of things have firmware that uh, we have to be concerned about. One uh, collaboration I'm looking at there is with the OpenBMC project to be able to take advantage of the, the open source in the management controller for the, uh, uh, the servers. And I'm also uh, collaborating with the, um, the Mass Open Cloud project that's trying to build secure uh, bare metal clouds. I'm cautiously optimistic about uh, enclaves and how they will help us with security, especially uh, in an environment where we control the firmware and we can ensure that the enclaves are set up in a safe way. There are a lot of uh, issues on GitHub. Again, please uh, welcome contributions. I hope everyone uh, gets inspired to, um, to, to work on installing this on their laptop. Um, and if, if you are interested, uh, I'll be hanging out at the core boot assembly uh, uh, later today and occasionally this week. Um, the Core Boot team uh, has a bunch of people here. They have uh, Flash programmers and can help you uh, install Core Boot on your laptop. Um, source code for uh, heads is available on GitHub. And uh, an annotated version of this talk is, is up on, on my website and welcome uh, comments and feedback on it. So, Thank you all for coming to hear about this project. I hope that everyone is you know, as excited about open source firmware as I am, and I'd love to uh, take any questions uh, that you all have. Thanks for your great talk. This is very interesting. Do you have any advice for the 95% of us who are stuck on non-core boot compatible laptops? <laughs> Buy a Chromebook. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it's hard to trust the closed source firmware. Um, you know, it's certainly uh, uh, 
we, there are people we have to trust. There are institutions we have to trust. We have to trust Intel to some extent. And Intel is responsible for you know, both our CPUs and a lot of the firmware. Um, the, uh, depending on your threat model, f firmware attacks may not be a huge concern um, for, for your particular machine, or they might be you know, of grave concern, in which case, uh, even just doing some of the things um, that Peter Stuj uh, suggested, Stuj suggested of um, uh, clipping the right protect pin on the, um, uh, on, on the chip, you know, removing things that might be hostile and attacking your system, his, his guides, his guide is a really good one to follow for uh, the hardware security. Um, I was wondering if you also support ARM, or is it, I just saw Intel laptops, so I was wondering. So ARM it has a lot of advantages as a CPU. Uh, it only has uh, 20 years of legacy baggage rather than uh, 40. And the boot process on it is much, much simpler since it doesn't have to go through uh, real mode to long mode to uh, paging and all the other steps. The, uh, the downside to a lot of ARMs is that they, uh, their boot code is, few, is on die and outside of the control of, um, of the user. Luckily, most of that boot code is fairly simple. Um, and... Uh, can establish, and some of them will establish a hardware root of trust. But in general, um, uh, yeah, the, the ARM to U-boot uh, to uh, whatever uh, seems to work out pretty well. Um, I know there's been some interest in can can U-boot be replaced with with a Linux BIOS or core boot-like thing, um, and uh, I suspect the folks at the booth would be able to talk more about that. And then, just to follow up, so if, you, so if Core Boot or Libre Boot supports the platform, it heads will work too, right? Is this? Essentially, yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it heads, is a, heads is a payload for Core Boot. Okay. Um, it's there on the left. Uh, thank you. There's a question from, from the internet um, about um, Core Boot. Core Boot has um, blobs included. And, um, for example, binary blobs from Intel with all the firmware support package and uh, all that stuff. How can we call Core Boot secure then in the light of this, uh, let alone open source? So the Intel FSP is a significant concern. Uh, this is the firmware support package that is required to initialize the memory controllers on, on modern uh, Intel CPUs. Um, on, uh, on older CPUs, um, such as the, uh, uh, the Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, the uh, Core Boot and uh, uh, Libre Boot are able to initialize the memory natively without having to go into the FSP. Um, However, if you look at what, uh, what Core Boot is doing in the MRC on those platforms, it tends to just be poking a bunch of registers with values that uh, seem to work. And uh, it's modern memory controllers are so complex that an Intel is unwilling to document them that without extensive NDAs, uh, that it's very hard to build any sort of memory initialization. So while we can't say it's 100% free software, um, we can at least uh, we can ensure that the FSP is measured and it's uh, unchanging. We can also uh, look at the state of things um, uh, that, it, that it sets up and include those in our measurements. So even if it doesn't get us 100% uh, open source, um, and as far as I know, the only system that does that right now is uh, uh, Bunny's uh, Novena laptop. Um, uh, at least we can measure it and we can know that it hasn't been tampered with from what we initially installed. Number four. Hi, so this is a great project um, and I'd like to ask um, why you did certain architectural decisions uh, the specific combination of Linux and Shell. So why didn't you choose a BSD kernel, which are usually perceived to be more secure and of a higher quality? And why did you choose a Shell over, let's say, Python or Haskell, which are also often perceived of a higher quality? So th there is a lot of desire to support Python in heads. The downside is that there's very limited space. The X230 uh, boot ROM, for instance, 
has uh, four megabytes uh, of available space. The Python interpreter is a, um, a couple of megs already. The, uh, in, in terms of why Linux over BSD, uh, the KExec system call is a uh, core component of this. To be able to uh, do a graceful shutdown and transfer from the Linux kernel to another kernel or to, to any multi-boot compliant um, uh, kernels, which includes BSD, it is a necessary feature. Um, if, it, if BSD uh, had such functionality, that, that it would be a fine uh, just, um, choice for the, uh, the internal uh, boot ROM uh, bootloader. Uh, thanks for great work. Uh, how uh, how to perform updates of uh, core boot and uh, its payload when uh, its binary is used for, in measurement for uh, releasing encryption key? Then when you update uh, uh, core boot, the, this measurement will change and you will not no longer will be able to boot the system. Uh, how to solve that problem? So migrated encryption keys with TPM uh, requires a explicit step of uh, retrieving the key from the TPM with the current configuration and then resealing it with the new configuration. Um, one advantage of a reproducible build is the hashes of, the, uh, of all the firmware stages can be published. Uh, can, can be pre-computed, and then the PCR values can be pre-computed. So you can, re you can seal the keys for the new values. Um, in terms of the update process for, um, uh, for, for the head's payload, uh, one of the things that we're working on is being able to have a even more minimal heads that has just a USB device driver that you can boot into, copy the, uh, your new payload, and then install that elsewhere on, on the chip. Um, and part of that process would involve uh, resealing uh, any of the keys that, that you need to transfer. Um, another question from the internet. Thank you. Um, on your web page, you implemented head on ThinkPads only. How much work is still needed to translate this to, let's say, non-ThinkPads? ThinkPads are really popular uh, with the security community. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to look out at near the hall here and see how many ThinkPads there are. Um, and as a result, the core boot community has been very uh, supportive of, of ThinkPads. There's, uh, other than the ThinkPads and um, uh, the Chromebooks, there aren't a lot of devices that, that support core boot uh, out of the box. And that's something that I hope would change. I hope that some OEMs would realize there is value in providing open source firmware and m move, to, uh, move to using it, both as a cost-saving measure as well as a, um, a freedom measure. Um, in terms of the difficulty importing core boot to a platform, uh, I haven't successfully done that yet, but I suspect the people at the assembly uh, would be happy to uh, discuss that further. Uh, would you plan to um, rework an embedded, embedded control firmware on ThinkPads because it's a remaining closed part which has which still, which still has an access to the LPC bus and uh, probably couldn't be trusted? Uh, so your question is, how do we uh, how do we replace the EC? Uh, yes, do you plan to replace EC with uh, open source firmware as uh, in Chromebooks? So uh, the Chromebook has open source EC. Um, the uh, part of building core boot for a Chromebook involves uh, installing the ARM cross compiler to build the EC firmware. And the Chromebooks actually have a really elegant protocol for the EC to attest to the CPU that it is running the firmware that you think it is running. Um, on other platforms, uh, this would require a lot more research. The uh, the doc most of, many of the EC chipsets uh, have uh, uh, data sheets available, so it's possible to read through and see how they work. Um, and most of them have updatable firmware. Uh, in the case of the ThinkPads, there's a module in the ThinkPad BIOS that will do that update. Um, there's, we would need to figure out what that protocol looks like 
Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, if you have a working prototype on SynPads, uh, probably want to uh, add a remaining bit as open source CC on SynPads as well. It's uh, uh, the first place. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I understood your, your follow up. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if you if, if you have a, a working prototype on syncpads and only on syncpads, uh, will you finish uh, someone soon a uh, current existing uh, prototype of open source uh, EC uh, existing on H8 uh, by Linux, uh, or you are planning to extend? Uh, uh, your work on other platforms and finish uh, these bits later. Yeah, right now I have not personally made any progress on the ThinkPad EC. Um, uh, I was looking into it because I have a modified keyboard on my ThinkPad that needs a updated EC firmware, but I haven't actually gotten into into that. that that's an area of uh, of open research. Thank you. Two quick questions from the IRC. Are you planning to use System D in the boot pro uh, process? <laughs> That's the first one. And the second one. Um, let's say you flash your firmware in the in the um, at the Congress right here, um, with the help of a hardware programmer. Can you update um, when there's a new version, um, or do you have to um, currently need the the hardware access to update? Right now. Uh you can update afterwards um, at great risk uh, because you can leave the flash um, uh, writable, and then you can flash, which would allow you to flash after the fact. Uh, we are still working on a good procedure for doing uh, firmware, software only firmware updates once the boot, the immutable boot block is installed. Um, and to the other question. Uh, did I mention that we are really short on space and we don't want to put any uh, uh, large applications like, uh, like SystemD on, on there? It was a good one. Um. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all.